Delighted it's a small group tonight. So, Mr. Smolka and Jelmix, thank you for coming. They're my guests. So, so, so I'm glad they're here. Um, before I get started, I want to talk about pheasants. So I'm glad. I don't. Know, does anyone belong to pheasants forever? You, you're going to be an expert on that, and I'm not. Uh, on, on current pheasants situations, I mean. So I'm going to stop right around 1980. So the last 40 years, that's something I don't know much about at all. Um, so the work that they do and um, what, what the, sta what the st true status of pheasants are right now, maybe you can fill us in when we get down there, what you, what you, how you see it. But I, I don't know much about it. I, I, I was never a successful pheasant hunter in my life. I never was. I shot one rooster in my life, um, uh, in part because this guy was a crack shot. It's my dad. He was a marksman um, and during the Cold War. He was in Alaska. And he was something else to hunt with because he would shoot. I mean, he just, I saw him drop a deer on the run, a buck on the run. At, it must have been 60 or 70 yards. He just dropped it. I was hunting with him once. Um, see him shoot it, pick a, pick a rifle up, and a, an animal on the move and drop it. it just, he was just an incredible shot. So um, when we went pheasant hunting, I mean, he was such a good shot, he would let his kids shoot. I couldn't hit anything. <laughs> so he, you know, he would jump in once in a while, but he was such a good, uh, um, good hunter. But he's growing up, this picture is taken about 1955, 56, which is the peak of pheasant really in Gratiot County. That's when it was the best. And he had a um, collection of tails, uh, of pheasant tails, the tail feathers, which my grandmother put in his room in a, in a vase. And so I grew up with these pheasant feathers, and when, when, when he passed, I made sure that one of the grandsons got it, and I told him the story about it. I said, those are pheasants that your grandfather shot, probably in the 1950s. But um, my earliest memory is this on the right, is that he was uh, in my grandparents' basement. I must have been four or five, and he's scalding this pheasant to pull those feathers off. And I just remember all this steam coming up. And I remember saying, you're not coming down here. This is, you know, this bird, you, you'll burn, so you're not coming down here. But I can still remember that pheasant hanging, you know, out of, the, out of that container. He's picking those feathers off of there. Uh, so, yeah. It was in the bottom of Grandma's, it was in Grandma and Grandpa's house, not at our house. So that's where, but I remember, that's probably my earliest memory about pheasants. But uh, when family, family, there are some family movies, um, where he shot pheasant pictures of pheasants on the farm, and I remember getting so excited about, you know, look at the pheasants, look at the pheasants. Um, and he grew up at a time, he got to hunt at a time when it was at its best in Gratiot County. I hunted at a time when it was at its, in its decline. I mean, it was really in decline. Um, no, please don't, please don't do this. Please don't do this to me. Okay. So, uh, I guess I was going to read this little uh, this little excerpt from the Gratiot County Herald. This is 1920, so pheasants have been here. Pheasants have been here for over 20 years, but they're really struggling. And somebody wrote this article to um, the Herald and said, "Who killed the last deer in Gratiot?" He says, "Dear editor of Herald, this is from Elder Rushby, whoever this is from Lafayette." He said, "I wish to ask the question: Who last killed a deer running at large in Gratiot County, or a wolf, uh, or a turkey, a bear, a passenger?" or wild pigeon. We believe the late Frank Ulick of Laugh Lafayette shot the last bear in Gratiot, or rather last shot at the last bear in Gratiot. What reason or reasons do scientists give for the sudden disappearance of the beautiful wild pigeon and these other animals? So by the turn of the 20th century, I mean, our wildlife has been decimated. So um, it's big news if somebody sees a bobcat or a red fox, um, this is big news. It usually gets in the newspaper that somebody has seen this or shot one or found one. Uh, we just don't have that much wildlife. Uh, the, one, the one thing that people are concerned about at this time are the quail and the quail population. That's one, one remaining species that, that hunters are after in the county. 
So um, that's kind of the backdrop in the early 20th century when pheasants started to arrive here. They, they are strangers. Um, people are concerned that pheasants will run off the quail, um, that they won't, that, that they'll damage the habitat. Uh, habitat. There's a lot of skepticism about, uh, about pheasants. Um, George Washington had pheasants. Ben Franklin's nephew or son had pheasants. They were English pheasants, but in both cases, the pheasants were, were, were basically um, extinguished on their, on their farms. Uh, this is about the time of the civil, about the American Revolution. <clears throat> but this guy, uh, Judge, uh, Judge Owen Denny, was a, a consul, like an ambassador to Japan in the 1880s, and he and his wife had this fascination with pheasants. And uh, he was interested in bringing pheasants over to Portland, Oregon. And in 1881, he brought 12 male pheasants and three females and let them go on his farm. And he told the people that they were to leave the pheasants alone, you know, no hunting. And there was a little bit of a growth to the, uh, to the flock. A year later, he brought over 30 birds. And they were late, let go in the Willamette Valley. Again, the community was told no hunting, let them go. And <clears throat> the, the population raised, quickly rose to 1,000 birds until men went in and again extinguished the whole flock. Hunters went in and just shot them, you know, mercilessly. And that's a, that's a, a common issue I think with with pheasants is that people can't leave the pheasants alone. Uh, to let them populate, or there's overhunting. There, there are traces of this over the last 100 years here in Gratiot County. If it's just when that has happened. Um, but we think the first pheasants probably uh, came to Gratiot County about 1898. Um, there's an article that says Dr. Scott and George Reed of Ithaca brought in a, <clears throat> or will receive a, a selection of eggs uh, in town. And it's not for sure what the Scots did with the eggs or how successful it was, but this is the first time it's mentioned. In 1905, uh, pheasants are, are, are mentioned as being protected in Gratiot County. They were off limits, and they would be for another 20, 23 years. No hunting of pheasants. They were to be left alone uh, with, the, with the chance to propagate. Um, and also, was, it was in, under, the, under the rule that said pheasants are game owned by the state of Michigan. They are the state property, and they are to be left alone. But <clears throat> these four species. Uh, over the first 30 years are brought into the state uh, to game farms and uh, Mongolians, English blackneck, Japanese pheasants, and East Chinese ringnecks make up these four groups, but we know them, we know most of these birds today as the ringneck. And so most of these ringnecks that uh, were hunted in the, in the last century were descendants of these, of these breeds uh, that were crossed and whether in the game farms or in the wild. Oh, that's the one, those are the ones that we know. Um, it was about 19, yeah, it was about 19, uh, was well, 1895 when pheasants first came to Michigan. Uh, uh, this is, there's a monument down in, uh, down by Holland where this uh, Baumgartel brought them in and let them go. Um, and you can see the monument, there's a pheasant on it. This is, uh, this is a, this was an article again. This is about 1905. Ringneck pheasants and prairie chickens. Oh, this is actually 1920. It's after World War One. Are both found in Gratiot County, so they're starting to take off. Um, by 1920, also uh, people are getting birds, and they're br not just bringing eggs. They're bringing birds into the county. Um, Elverson and Sons Store in Ithaca had birds uh, for people who wanted to pick up. It's not. We're not sure if they're chicks or if they're if they're Adult birds are what they are. It was by 1928. By 1928, um, Michigan was ready for its first uh, for its first uh, hunting season. Prior to that, eggs had been distributed uh, across the state of Michigan. I mean, way up here in the north, which is not good pheasant habitat at all, or in the UP. But there's an attempt to bring eggs, or in some cases, birds. And if you look across that central belt, you see there's here are all these eggs and mature birds are coming in. This is going to be the, the, the prime range of uh, bird hunting in the, in the 20th century across that belt and then up in the San Lac County, kind of like a fish hook there. <clears throat> Why not the UP? Uh, hard winter, um, too many woods and forests, not enough uh, um, Forage. For, yeah, for, for birds. A lot, of it's, a, lot of, a lot of it was the climate, just, they just they couldn't, they didn't make it. 
Winter's exceptionally hard on them. There is, <clears throat> I've never been up there, but in the hunting and trapping guide, in the UP's banana belt, there is a small population and they have their own season. It opened uh, October 10th and it runs to the 31st. That's zone one, isn't it? We yeah. call it zone one today? Yeah. yeah today we call it zone two would be what, above us? I think, I think so. Yeah. And we're zone three, which is kind of along that frost line, I think, in that area there, which opens, I think, it opens later this week, I think. October 20th is open opener yeah. of the pheasant season yeah. down here. Down here in zone three. Yeah, and then just that little bit of zone one in Menominee County, a little bit of Delta has a farm belt where there's wild pheasants, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so the 1920s and 30s were largely spent trying to grow, really grow a mature uh, bird population. One of the things that uh, the state would say over and over was that they believed that there was a 10-year cycle on pheasants. That if pheasants were allowed to take off and mature and repopulate, it would, it would take off peak and then it would recede again. And this was supposed to be a 10-year cycle. Um, and we kind of see that cycle in the 1950s when things start to, again, when things really start to uh, change for the better and then it hits a, creep, uh, hits a peak and then it goes into the serious decline again. Um, on October 1928, Michigan had its first pheasant season. It opened October 25th in Gratiot County. Um, somewhat successful. By the 1930s, uh, the Gratiot County Conservation League also wanted to see more pheasants brought into Gratiot County. They took eggs uh, and they tried to hatch the eggs or give them to farmers to have chickens uh, uh, incubate the eggs. It was only about a 50% success rate. Um, it was also the first time that adult birds were, were, were really being brought uh, into the county. You can see on that right there that uh, there we are on the, on the map right there. <clears throat> Another thing that, uh, oh, very jumping ahead to the 1940s here. So I found a couple pictures of families that are actually hunting at this time. Secords and Gibbs. This was taken in October 1948. Mm -hmm. Hunting got better. The picture said the dog wouldn't hunt after the first shot. <laughs> All that <laughs> do was stay near the Secords. Um, I'm jumping ahead here myself. I want to talk about flushing bars. Do I have a picture of flushing bars? Flushing bars, not come back. Here we are, flushing bars. This is a depression idea. The pictures are modern, but uh, during the Great Depression, there was a movement for farmers to create flushing bars. So when they're cutting, uh, whenever they're out in the hay fields or uh, where they're cutting things to put a, a bar out in front of the tractor with bells or some type of a chain on it. So it'll create a noise so when, when the tractor came down uh, through the farm, the birds would have a chance to escape before they'd be chopped up. And so these were called flushing boards and uh, they first appeared in 1939 in Gratiot County. Um, what else can I tell you about the 1930s, 40s? Um, um, just a quick question. Yep. If they knew that it was a 10-year cycle, why not start at year five and reintroduce? I mean, if you know that's happening, why not? You had to ask for eggs first of all. You had to apply for them. And but then, if the counties knew, why not just make your program strong? Sounds like a good question. Say it again. If you know there's a 10-year cycle well, <clears throat> before it, the demise, why not start at year five, introduce more birds so that at the end of the first 10-year cycle, you're strong at five years for the second cycle? Why not, if you know that, why not do that? One of the things that was talked about throughout the 1940s and 50s was when they hit that cycle, when they hit that end, why not have a closed season for yeah, one or two seasons? Cool. And, and, Grash, and, and the lower season, uh, Zone 3 never did it. They just never did it. They never went through with it. One of the things they talk about, pheasants, unlike other game birds, it's easy to differentiate between the males and the females. So a lot of biologists say some of the studies that, uh, and male roosters are polygamous. So a lot of biologists think that if you have a season where the hens are protected, even when the population is down, uh, taking roosters uh, in a regulated season, you know, within a few weeks window, 
that shouldn't uh, affect the overall population. Supposedly one rooster, there's a bunch of books at MSU when I was in college, because I like fizzling and all that. Supposedly one rooster can, uh, can take care of uh, up to 10 hens within a, that are in a square mile radius of where he's, his crowing site is. Okay. So that would, according to that, Matthew, could, you could 90% of the rooster pheasants could be harvested or taken by predators th uh, through the spring and then the population would still be able to survive yeah did the probably. hunting did the bars actually work I mean with the speed of the tractors especially if you're chopping corn or something now that wouldn't work I think it was for hay fields because my dad's you know those hens their instinct is to try to protect their right. their their eggs so or their chicks and they see something that's like a monster they're gonna try to hop cover their chicks yeah, and then they get chopped up. Yeah. yeah but the, with this I don't know what the speed was then, but with the speed now that we cut hay, it wouldn't have, they would hunker down and just never get away. They wouldn't, I mean, they wouldn't make it. I think it's why our hay field, why the clover fields are not successful. Plus, like over by me, where I'm at, by Whitmore's, I mean, they're cutting, they're cutting clover, what, four or five times? Five times. Those birds would never have a chance to, 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 get to in brood a nest. That's what my dad said. Uh, when he was a kid, the first cutting usually wasn't until sometime in June mid to late June, and there was two or three cuttings. Now there's five. So a lot of times, chicks are already hatched by June. They can scurry away from a, a, a combine, but now yeah. they're cutting in May, and like you said, five times. It looks like a lawn. And, and, and the time. machines move so much quicker now. Yeah, there's so much And they're so much bigger. Yeah. And we, we take out deer all the time. Yeah. Run mm -hmm. them, chop them up. The little ones that are hiding? Um, some of the things about the depression and pheasant hunting, um, one of the problems was uh, people stealing dogs. Um, in, 19, in the hunting season 1939, 12 dogs were taken in Gratiot County in 10 days. What most, did they, of the, most of them in Southern Gratiot, most at night. What people, did they do with them? Steal them. Steal them or resell them. Hunting dogs, yeah. Oh, okay. Hunting dogs. Most of, them were, um, most of them were setters and beagles that were taken. So the, 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 the um, sheriffs had told people to put your dogs in at night, beware of people around your areas because dogs are coming up missing. Uh, one dog on the Clarence Clark estate was then worth $150 uh, wow. that, that they lost. So, yeah. um, Sunday hunting was also an issue. I think in 1939, Gratiot County was actually outlawed this past, and until about 1941 or 42, until the war started. So this, is a, this is a big deal. Churches did not want people out hunting on Sunday, and they really fought this uh, for a while until it was eventually repealed. Um, another one that was used um, in the Depression was pheasant banding, banding pheasants. And so if you shot a bird, you were supposed to notify the state you know, of, the, of this band so they could track it. Banding went on until the 1950s. If a bird lived five years, if a rooster lived five years, like one did down in Hillsdale, they considered that to be quite a uh, extreme, extremely long lifespan. These bands. So um, all of the pheasants were banded. Yes. If, if they could, the, if they could. Yes. Keep track of them. They were trying to monitor the population. Yeah. Another thing that happened uh, at the end of the depression was um, hunting co-ops, and there were nine of these in Gratiot County, uh, in different townships. Um, Seville had two, Pine River had one, New Haven, Arcata, Sumner, North Shade, where um, hunters or where farmers had tickets that they would give out to hunters uh, who asked to hunt on their, uh, on their property, uh, especially for those who were outside Gratiot County. And this was the problem, was that people were coming onto farms and leaving gates open and animals were getting out and um, they felt their, their property was you know, being destroyed. So they tried this for a while, and the, and the complaint was the farmers wouldn't give the tickets out to strangers. They'd give the tickets out to people in the county that they knew they could trust. Yeah. And so outsiders came and complained, you know, we don't get a chance, we don't get a chance legally to hunt. And the idea was to let them hunt on property that they would not deface, um, you know, or do something to. And they would try, they would try cooperatives for about 10 or 15 years. So we're at the 1940s here. So 40s and 50s, this, these are the boom years. Um, 1940, 2, 3, 4, 5 are generally good years. I wonder why. 
World War II. World War II. Yeah. There you go. Uh, there's just not, not enough hunters out there. So the birds have a chance to regroup and repopulate. Uh, there's also a shortage of gun shells. And there was a little store down on Ely Highway at the corner of Ely and there is a... Um, St. Charles? St. Charles. There was a little tiny store down there. And people down at that end of the county knew that was the place to go to get shotgun shells because he had them. Even though they were kind of rationed, he had shotgun shells. And so people would drive from the southern end of the county just to go to that little store to get shotgun shells during, the or during World War II to hunt pheasants and other birds. Okay, uh, Nimrods. I, I asked kids, well, was I going to get in trouble for showing this picture today? <laughs> did, did you hear about this? You heard about this? No, no, no. I heard a little bit about Disney says no more Elmer Fudd with guns. Oh. Uh, so I don't know if that offends anybody. That wasn't the intent, but. That is offends me. Um, Elmer Fudd's supposed to have a shot. Right. <laughs> and, um, well, the other one was um, 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 Yosemite Sam can no longer have a gun. Mm -hmm. and, and Holster, so. But Wiley e. Coyote and uh, the Roadwork can still blow each other up with they dynamite they and bombs. drop boulders on each yeah. other. Handbills and all that yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, there were all kinds of uh, issues with Nimrods, and a Nimrod was somebody who didn't seem to know what they were doing um, at the right time or at the right place. Uh, usually people that were from out of the county and were causing problems one way or another. Uh, for example, down by Ashley, a Mrs. Pauline Sparks uh, was shot in the arm when her husband's gun went off. He was reaching for a pheasant he had hit, and he straddled his gun the wrong way, and the shotgun went off, and she caught pellets in her leg. Um, Melvin Fisk of Ashley had a rollover uh, with his car because he tried to avoid a flock of pheasants in May 1949. Um, a pheasant hunter northwest of, northwest of Ithaca chased a rooster into a cornfield, fired at it as it flew over what he thought was a boulder. It turned out to be a doe, which he ended up killing. This was big news. A couple of Middleton um, had broken windows when a pair of pheasants flew inside, uh, landed on the mantle, turned around and flew back out again. So. But one of the problems, uh, one of the problems was this. This was addressed with this issue called the Horton Trespass Act, which started in 1939 uh, to try and get, try to regulate where you hunt and how you hunt. And the whole whole premise was get get to know your farmers, ask them for permission, treat their property with respect. You know, which is what I heard as a kid in the 1970s was that's how you're supposed to do it. Don't just walk out on somebody's. No. bean field and, oh. and go down through there you know with your dogs and knock the beans off white beans it used to be oh. white beans you knock those off the pods and stuff you know so don't don't do that that was the premise of the Horton Trespass Act so, so again I talked about some of these people but, you know different injuries and things crazy things that happen lots of stories about fines I mean thousands of dollars of fines every year in Gratiot County, number one, too many birds in possession. Number two, hunting birds out of set season, usually in the winter time. Um, I didn't really write the story down. Four Mexican men north of St. Louis were arrested because they're hunting in January, and they had four or five rooster pheasants in the car they got caught with, hunting out of season. Um, it's a common theme among them rods. So. Uh, another challenge, um, how do you monitor your bird counts? This was an issue uh, the state tried to propose to people. Uh, if you got up early in the morning, usually a half hour to an hour after sunrise or before sunset, um, you could listen for a call or you, there was some kind of device that made a call. You could, something you could do, I don't know what to call, call a rooster. <coughs> return. Right. They crow. Because I was a volunteer, the DNR was still doing the crow counts, they called it, through the mid-90s. I was a volunteer in my 20s. they give you a map. You would park at first light at certain spots, and they wanted you to count how many rooster pheasants you heard crow in, I think it was two minutes. Mm -hmm. And you drive to the next spot. And if it was obviously the same bird, they didn't want you to count the same rooster twice. How could you tell? Well, sometimes there's one that's really loud and really close to you, so you know it's the same bird, even if he crows again 30 seconds later. So did you call them, or did you just wait and listen? I just waited and listened. I didn't have, but I know what you're talking about. Because the newspapers are suggesting that they, they actually had routes. 
that they told them to, to come down through come down through Isabella County and down through Gratiot to Clinton and they would stop, you say stop periodically and then do the call or listen for a call and they figured out every every rooster was worth how many hens? Ten. A couple a couple of hens? Yeah, at least. In an area? To give you an account. Yeah, I just did uh, Elba Township. They had a route for me, and I'm sure they had a volunteer for every township in Gratiot County. How long did the count go on? It was in May and June. I think that's when roost they do crow in the fall, but they're very active in the spring. I think it's part of the whole courtship ritual that they have to try to attract mates. What does it sound like? Does it sound it's like a like scratchy. I can't imitate animal sounds. Oh, it's please. It's sound like a rooster, regular yeah. chicken rooster. Have you never heard of I, I was going to play some for you, but I couldn't oh, get reception in there. Oh, yeah. Try it. See if you get pheasant crowing. Yeah. 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 And it, sometimes they cackle when they flush. As oh, man. The, the scariest thing as a yeah. kid for me was, I, and I was, I say I was a nimrod. I was out there hunting, yeah. and then you flushed a rooster, and it took off. And as he's flying, he's cackling. I mean that you can hear that that loud noise. You know, as he's it's like buck fever. And then he's he's just then he just coasts. Yeah. You know, they fly for a little, and then they just coast. You watch him go across the field. Oh yeah, it's if you don't know what you're doing, it scares the heck out of you. So, yeah. So do I take that to mean he was laughing at you? I yeah. think so because I, I could never hit anything. Uh, when I missed, he said he was laughing at me. He was giving you the feather because yeah. he was flying straight away from me. All I could see was his tail. <laughs> I remember getting mad enough once I kicked my boot off. I, well, I can't hit these birds. I shot them. So uh, the other way they measured was uh, mail carriers. <clears throat> Uh, also were out uh, at the time Mr. Smoke was talking about here, May, June, and watching for broods crossing the road and then counting how many hens they saw with, if, if they could, and if they could estimate how many chicks were in the brood or not, how many broods they would see at a time. And this was, I think this was used more in the 1950s and 60s than, than is used with the, um, with the crow counts, at least in the newspapers here in, in this county. Yeah. Yeah. There's pheasants from our people that, like Mr. Viles, that could know more about that than I do, but I think you're right. Yeah. And there was, of course, this affected the local economies in a lot of places. Um, there were local cafes and, and places to eat who purposely stayed open on pheasant season day. O opening day was a big thing. There was a cafe in Ashley uh, who advertised, you know, we are open. We are open for pheasant season. Come in, you know. Uh, come in for to take a break. When is that advertisement? Uh, that's the 1950s. Mm -hmm. yeah. is that it? Gonna get it. Oh, is that there it is. Yep. There it is. That's that is it. it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good job. You see a lot more than you ever done. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, that's a good one. I tried to find one when they were flying, when he was flying and making that noise. I couldn't find one on there, but it's it's haunting <laughs> when you hear. If you don't know what you're doing, it can really it'll wake you up. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, places like Lens and St. Louis, Van Atten's, um, you know, come in. Small game season. So the 1950s were really the highlight of, uh, I think, the high point of, of uh, hunting pheasants. A lot of high schools had pheasant dinners. Uh, Breckenridge, 1952, had a dinner one night, fed 120 people. St. Louis FFA also had one about that time, fed over 100 people, uh, invited people to come into. Community township halls might have gatherings where they had pheasant suppers. So it was very prevalent to, to do that at that time. But it looks to me, I would guess, probably 1955. That's about the high. That's about the peak of, of pheasant hunting in, in the county. Are they hunting with cocker spaniels? Uh, looks like it doesn't. It looks, looks like it doesn't. Like the ears. Yeah. Could be. Could be. Could be an Irish setter. Irish setters were popular for their dogs back yeah, yeah, that one has longer The one at the bottom looks bigger, like a setter. I understand. It could be a setter. It could, it could be. a question. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they hunt and point, it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> this is actually kind of out of context. This was taken about 1951. A couple of the Flegel brothers uh, down by North Star hunting pheasants here. So. 
Um, one of the issues that went on in, toward the end of the 1950s was how do you feed the birds, especially in the hard winters. Uh, this is a very young Dave Walsh, and this is his dad. And they are uh, going out in the countryside. They've got a, a truckload of ear corn, and they're going out to drop off corn for the pheasants so they have something to eat. This is something my dad strongly believed in. Uh, and I can remember about the time of the ice storm in 1976, coming back from St. Louis for some reason, and we, as we got to the, to the clover leaf, there must have been four or five rooster pheasants on the east side of the road where the gas stations used to be. There was a Gulf Oil gas station, and there was the, the clover leaf restaurant, and they were all lined up along the edge of the road, and, the, and the, the pavement had just started to melt, and they were out dancing around there. My dad says they're going to get hit, and I said, what's going on? Well, they're... One, they're looking for food, and also they're looking probably for grit for their crop. Mm -hmm. And so what, we, what do you do? We ran straight home. He goes to the bar, and he grabs a container, a coffee can of shell corn that he had. He scoops it up. We get back in the truck. We run back to the, to the clover leaf, and he starts driving up and down the clover leaf, throwing corn out the window at the pheasants so that hopefully they can see it, but also not come out in the road to get it. Wow. And so he's doing that, and then when he's... And that's when he's going this direction. When he's going southbound, he's doing it. When it's going northbound, he turns around. He makes me do it. I think I throw it out the window. You know, he says, we throw it out so they can see it, but so they don't come out the road and get hit. Good times, so, Jim. Good times. So, take care of the. I guess the best is take care of the pheasants. You know, take care of them. He he, he knew that. He'd seen that. So, but the the the, the 1960s and 70s. As well, this is the down decline of pheasants in the county and also in Michigan. Um, mailmen saw less broods. Um, counts are down, mail carriers don't see that many, crow, uh, crow calls are down, and so uh, by 1962-63, people are saying, like in Gratiot County, hey, something is wrong. And although this is Sanilac County, this eventually spreads across, across Michigan. The value of farmland increases so much, farmers are cleaning out their ditches, and they're pulling out, they're pulling out hedgerows which is what the pheasant needs to um, survive. And there's discussion about other things. It will be PB, or it, will, it, will be, it will be DDT, it will be pesticides. Um, um, the, the role, they want to argue about the role of the fox. The fox are killing too many, too many birds. Um, the raccoons are spoiling too many nests uh, in April, May, June. Um, there's, if you have a really wet spring, uh, it spoils the nesting period for the, for the hen pheasants. So, um, you know, all these things are being bandered about uh, as the 60s go on, but th I think this was the main reason of why, um, why the pheasant went into such decline. You just don't see fence rows. I went out, and I'm kind of in charge of mowing the fence row on my property. I don't own all of it, but the, 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 I inherited it when I moved out there in the 1990s. Uh, I, mow the, I mow the track that goes eighth of a mile behind my house to a ditch, large ditch. And I let it go this, summer, this spring because I was busy, and so the, the clover and stuff, I mean, it was up there. It was approaching a foot. So I thought, I'm not going to go down through there unless I go down first to see, one, do I flush any, any fawns, and two, do I flush any pheasants. And I went and got a long stick, and I'm singing as I walk down <laughs> through there, and I swing it, and I did it twice just to make sure I didn't, you know, run over something, and I didn't. But um, I, was, I guess I was destroying habitat, too, in, in a sense. So, so, so the numbers, I mean, this is 1966, here's Gratiot County, fair hunting, made projection, projection is fair. And this will be, it will go from fair to poor in a hurry. Um, again, so these were all arguments about what's going on in the 1960s. Uh, there was actually an editorial, did I find it or not? Let me see here. And I can read just part of this. This is from the Herald, I won't read the whole thing, but... It's called the pheasant crisis, and this is, this is after hunting season ends in 1967. This is what, it, what the writer says for the Gratiot County Herald. Um, the shortage of ringnecks comes as no news to those of us who are in Gratiot County, one of Michigan's richest agricultural areas, an area that should be able to support thousands of birds. The cold hard fact is that we aren't. Why? Ask 10 conservationists and you'll get 10 different answers. It could be amount of cover, uh, amount of cover chemicals, uh, raccoon population, foxes, winters are too hard, uh, or the normal cycle of decline with pheasants. The list goes on and on. The fact remains, however, that for at least 10 years the pheasants have been disappearing in Gratiot County. 
Um, as we suggested in this space five years ago, the Conservation Department should follow one of two courses. A, a one-year statement moratorium on shooting pheasants should be enacted, or zone hunting should be implemented. So I'm wondering if that's, what is, if that's the time zones really came in was the late 60s. I didn't know how far back zones went, but you know, I'm guessing it was about, that was one of the consequences, because they didn't close it. I don't, think, I don't think they ever put a moratorium on pheasant seasons in the 60s or 70s that I remember hearing about anyway. So, yeah. so more pictures of guys hunting. This guy's from St. Louis, I have his name here. The picture's important only because um, he's from St. Louis, but they're hunting down by Hillsdale, and it kind of symbolized that more and more hunters are going outside Gratiot County if they want to go find pheasants. And that guy is Marty Helms in St. Louis. Hmm. Right there. This is, um, is this an odd modder? That doesn't look like a pheasant's game. <laughs> <laughs> that one isn't, but that one oh, is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The other consequence was, well, they hunt for other birds. Yeah. Oh, they give up They give up on pheasants, and so they go, he's a hunting war by Elwell. Yeah. And so they go hunting for other, other things. They're not pheasants. We'll switch to ducks. A lot of, yeah. When I was hunting, in the, a lot of my teachers said, Oh, because I, you know, they knew I liked hunt pheasants. So I used to hunt pheasants all the time. But when the population crashed, they still wanted to hunt where they would see games. So they switched to duck hunting. Yeah. So no pheasants go, go for something else. Mm -hmm. Kind of the last thing that uh, the county did, another county did to try and revive the population. That early seventies was to, to was to hatch pheasants and get people to raise them and then release them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this. In about 1970, the Board of Commissioners actually wanted 4-H groups to do this. And so, but they had to get permission from what we call today the DNR to do it. So it took about a year. And um, the, the Lucky, I belong to the Lucky, Club, Lucky Clovers, and Herb Baxter, who was my 4-H uh, leader, was one of the first to hatch, to hatch pheasants as a civilian and give them out to 4-H students to, to try and raise. And one of those was Kim Bebo, late Kim Bebo of St. Louis, who um, did this. Ellis Williams was another one from St. Louis. He's, he's gone. He's no longer alive. He did that for a while uh, with the Lucky, Lucky Clovers. B.B. Beef uh, also did this, uh, and they tried it. You know, uh, I think the most that, that Bebo released at one time was like 25 birds, but they tried it briefly in the 1970s. <coughs> Uh, one of the last things also the DNR tried to do was called the, the Sichuan pheasant, which was a breed, another breed from um, from uh, um, China, and to bring in, bring them in, and see if they would take off. And from what I read about the Sichuan was that uh, it failed largely because the Sichuan was a pen-raised bird and did not do that well in the wild. Mm -hmm. So they tried it. They tried it a couple times. At one time, they released 2,000 birds. In the Michigan area, and it just they just didn't they didn't survive. Uh, they didn't make it through the winters. They just didn't seem to be that hardy of a bird. Their Sichuan genetics, <clears throat> enough of them survived that you'll still see a few all black black pheasants. <clears throat> I actually have a picture I sent. I took this. Uh, yeah, I live in Montcalm County, and I've shot a couple in there that have really thin pencil thin half neck rings. And I saw one on private land food plot. I took a picture. And sent to a friend of mine that bird hunts. So, so you think they cross? The yeah, they breeds? yeah. And once in a while, I'm not a science teacher, but uh, there's a there's probably some ringnecks have that recessive gene that expresses itself with mm -hmm. full black neck pheasants. Mm -hmm. So that, that that kind of leaves me. That's where I'm gonna leave off in the 1980s. But I did, I did some research here. I, you know, I was asking about pheasants now and. I like this from the sexy pheasant farm. <laughs> uh, yeah, what is the, the, yeah. um, uh, how, how many of these pheasant farms there are in the mid Michigan area, uh, and, or lower Michigan, uh, you could go to and you could hunt pheasants. Mm -hmm. And from these three, the fee was you got to pay, first of all, there's an entrance fee. You, do you take your own dog, or are you going to hire a dog, or are you going to hire a guide? And they were anywhere from $25 to $35 a bird. You paid that you shot on that farm, but they had uh, they had winter hunting, um, they had current ha hunting. They take by appointment, and I mean this is three out of I probably saw twenty of them. I just went online looking to see how many there were. There how might big, be more than that. How big are these farms? 
Uh, one old, oh, we, I know one that's close to 900 acres over here in uh, over here in the Thumb area. Okay. I think it's called the Up, the Upland Game Farm, and something it's like hundreds of acres. Okay. So, so people can go out and hunt on these private farms. So. I don't know the last time I've well, I well, just a minute. I forgot this one here. So, um, so you can pheasants forever. That they're, they're have a program or you know a mission to try and keep the birds, bring them back. Another one, the East Grash Pheasant Co-op. I think this was two years ago. This article is in the Herald. Yes. But, um, so we talked about this one. It was on. It'll be opening here this next. Week. I can't remember the last time I saw anybody hunting in Grash County birds. Well, I'm not. I mean, I'm not out running the roads during pheasant season. But I mean, I used to go just driving to Middleton in the morning. I would see a truck pulled over on M57. Out in a stubble field or somewhere, you can see the guys, you know, running, running dogs. It's odd, but I haven't seen one in 15 years. There's state land <clears throat> that's managed for pheasants that gets hunted hard uh, by the Maple River in Gratiot County. But yeah, you don't see many. There's a lot of private land habitat around anymore. So, so this was two winters ago. I looked out my bathroom window and I saw something moving mm -hmm. and, and I looked and in my pine trees here was this beautiful rooster pheasant mm -hmm. on a cold winter day and he was nesting and trying to eat berries, dried berries off some of these, these bushes. And so uh, remembering what my dad did, I later got a pan full of bird, bird feed and took it out. Uh, Took it out underneath some of the trees and left it there. I imagine the sparrows probably got it. But, <laughs> but um, I flushed a hen in July near my mailbox, and but I can't remember the last time I heard a rooster crow cackle. I don't know. Out in North Star Township. So I think that's it. That's thank it. you, Jim. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Do you? Yeah. It's, and it's very special every time. <laughs> well, I get I used to get excited when you hear them flying. The roosters when they're flying and cackling. Oh man. You know. So I haven't heard one in a long time. Ten years. I don't know. I haven't heard one out there where I live. Mm -hmm. So I see tracks once in a while mm -hmm. behind my house and uh, uh, you know rooster tracks. But everything I see is pheasants, or not pheasants, it's turkeys. Mm -hmm. 